Hey, what's up guys? This is Derek Green from Simple Torah, and I'm going to be talking to you today about the Dante 21 phase of Simple Torah on the Simple Quattro. So let's get into it and start back with SPV, the label that we were on at the time. And it was our second album on SPV, and we needed to think of a topic that we wanted to write about. Um, that's usually how we write albums, is think of a topic and then dive into that. And the music and the creation comes from that main focal point. So Andres and I were talking, and I, everybody primarily in the band, about ideas. And I came up with the idea of doing possibly an album surrounding the story, The Divine Comedy by Dante Alighieri. Um, There's a suggestion that I gave because it was a book that I read in high school and it was very influential to me um, just because it was packed with so many different characters and different events that are happening and they were very related to what was going on um, even in modern times, a lot of things that Dante was going through. Um, the book is very complex, um, a lot of a lot of words. It's a and it's actually a poem, so it's very difficult to read. Um, but we did the research. We went in and um, started to read the story again. And we also did a lot of information and background check, <laughs> background check of Dante and figuring out why he was writing this not with this story. You know what was inspir inspiring him to do this story. So there was so much to really write about um, because there's so many topics that were related to what was happening um, nowadays. And we decided to, since there were so many different topics, we wanted to break it into three sections, the album. Kind of like the actual book, The Divine Comedy, is broken up into uh, an area where Dante is entering into uh, hell, then purgatory, and then uh, Paradise. And so we decided to divide the album up into those different sections. And the representation of those sections would be the sound of the album. So Hell would have furious sounds of really um, aggressive sounding sepultura sound. And, um, and then changing it um, with Purgatory, having it uh, a different feeling to the album there, um, almost like a, a robotic type sound, I would think, or something that we were thinking of, something that's like what you're doing over and over again, um, repetitive in, in a way. And then the last part being uh, Paradise. So we, we broke the album up into three different sections, like the book itself. And, um, you know, it was something very challenging. And we wanted to start with the idea of the artwork in the very beginning of the writing process as well. So I believe it was Igor that suggested that we get Stefan Dorschkov. I, I'm probably slaughtering his last name. Uh, let me try it again. Stefan Deutsch North. <laughs> um, and a Brazilian artist who's incredible. Uh, he's done incredible work. Um, and we told him the idea of the album and he decided to do paintings um, of certain sections. So of hell, purgatory and paradise and his own interpretation. And we let him do that. You know, he went on his own and, and he was actually doing physical paintings, um, which ended up being the artwork uh, for the Dante 21 album. So it was really amazing like that was something that happened at the very beginning of the process um and, and during the writing of the album um the album we recorded in, in brazil it was in sao paulo and i was living on the same street as the studio which was perfect for me i would wake up walk down the street a few blocks and then be at the studio it's pretty much living at the studio um so it was a fantastic time, and it was really brought out of a lot of creativity, you know, being so close to home. Um, and we decided that we wanted to work with a different producer. Um, and so 
we decided that we would get Stanley Soares, who we've worked with as a sound engineer for Sepultura. He was working with us on the road, and, and so he knew everything about our sound and, and what we were about, and um, he was definitely into the idea of producing the album, and we were eager to have him uh, be a part of it. So this was something that was really, really cool to have, and we're gonna have Stanley come in and say a few words about uh, what it was like to work with us. Hello, everyone from Sepulquata. My name is Stanley Soares, and today I'm going to be sharing some of the memories I had of recording Dante with Sepultura. I remember back there, I was Sepultura front house engineer, and Andreas uh, approached me about the idea of using me also to do a studio album, right? Um, for me, it was great. It was a great opportunity to do something different. And also, like, it worked with a band that, that I knew so well musically, but also I knew as people, right? Uh, we, we used to spend a lot of time on the road. I was always touring with them extensively, uh, to the point sometimes I spend more time with them with, with my own family back home. It's crazy, but that's the way it was. So we tracked the album in Sao Paulo uh, at Trauma Studios, which was like a great uh, studio with a great room, great console. It was a perfect environment to do the album. And the album was based on on the Divine Comedy, uh, it was a book from Dante uh, Ligieri. So it was a completely different concept they, they were doing for the first time. Um, and then for me, it was a great opportunity to be there as a you know sound guy because, like I was saying, I, I knew them on stage. And for you guys who have seen them live, you can tell uh, they always deliver a very intense and powerful performance. And then I was, you know, kind of in a mission to bring that that feeling to to, to the record, right? And so uh, one of the funny things about it was like, um, I remember at some point talking to Derek about um, tracking vocals and he mentioned that it was, I was kind of weird to be on headphones with the microphone in front of him in a fixed position. So he always been concerned about not moving away from that when he was singing and that when he was on stage, he was just holding the mic and he could move all over the place, put his head up and down when he was screaming. And then uh, we literally on this album, we tried something like that. So I remember setting up like in a, a couple of speakers, like a PA, mini PA system in the room. So I actually I fit the mix uh, to that PA room and I gave him a microphone. I was like, right, so you go for it. So we're going to record the vocals like that. And that was all the vocals of the album, which was a great experience also for me. Um, for guitars and bass, we pretty much brought all the backline that you used to use for the live shows. So it was a bunch of Mesa Boogies and other brands of like uh, our guitar amps and all Paulos on pegs and stuff. And then we crank up up to 11, we shook up all the room. <laughs> it was loud as hell, but you know, I was trying to get the feeling when you go to a concert, right, you get the experience of like a something that it is so unique, right? And uh, we were trying to achieve that in the studio as well, and it was, was great. Um, working with Igor uh, on drums, it was like completely different because he is a drummer that doesn't play to a click track. So when they were doing the pass, you know, playing the song, sometimes he was coming up with new ideas that I was like, wow, this is great about how we can actually, you know, use this. And, but believe it or not, after he recorded every single take, I was listening, you know, and the tempo was the same. I don't know how to explain this, but he was always delivering the same tempo as he had like an internal click in his head. And, um, and also recording Andreas was lots of fun because I used to play guitar. So being in the room with a guitar player like him was, was great because you can see like he coming up with ideas, like, you know, building solos. And then he has like a, you know, the producer in mind, he can see the big picture. So it was uh, very nice. Uh, also, Paulo, <laughs> Paulo, he, he, man, <laughs> Paulo, I think he's one of the funniest guys I've ever met. <laughs> and also like, uh, and when he was recording his bass, between some jokes and <laughs> some funny moments, he was delivering all the tracks, you know? And it's funny because he plays exactly like he does on stage. He's standing up, holding his bass, you know, hitting the string very heavily, and which is part of the tone he achieved, right? Because he he overdrive the the rig on the point that it, some mid start open up because the way he playing he's playing. 
But anyway, so um, we did a few overdubs with orchestra instruments, I believe, after, but that was it. At the core of the band was like what, what I was explaining. And it was a joy. It was, I mean, it was always fun to be around them. <laughs> you know, they're, they're a great band. They're great people. And I look back with a smile on my face. It was always fun. So there we go. A little bit of the memories of recording Dante with Sepultura. And you guys keep tuned on Sepul Quarta. And keep safe. Bye. Uh, one of the fundamental people that uh, was super helpful in the creation of, of Dante was Maria Olette. Um, she was working at SPV. She was the A&R person. Um, and she has always been uh, helpful in so many ways in, 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 in pushing us. And um, she had a great idea to, once the album was completed and recorded, um, to have the listening session in Brazil and to have the entire world press come to Brazil, come to Sao Paulo, listen to the album, uh, get into the whole feeling of being in Brazil. And uh, so we arranged for all that to happen. The international crew of people, of, of journalists and everyone coming in, photographers, journalists, to, um, to have a listening in the studio in Sao Paulo. Not only did they come to the studio, but we took them to, I believe Andreas took them to Morambi, to a football game. Um, Paulo and I at the time had a bar called the Bunker Lounge, which was very popular um, with a lot of our friends and, and people. Um, different people were always coming there from the metal scene, rock scene, hip hop scene. There was a mixture of things going on in the Bunker Lounge. Um, we brought a lot of the the people, the journalists, we brought them there to our bar. Um, we just really wanted them to have a good time and, and, and enjoy Brazil and see how it is to be in a place like that. Um, because a lot of them had never been to Brazil before in their entire life. So that was a fantastic idea that Maria had. Um, but there was a lot of tension that was going on. Um, it was, this was the last album that we did with Igor and he definitely was there as far as being a part of, you know, the bringing stuff in to, to, to do the artwork. And, but it just felt that he, he wasn't really 100% into it. Um, once everything was done, um, he felt that he did not want to go on the road. He didn't want to tour on the album. So, at the end of a writing process, it's, it's always, you have to go on the road. It's important. What's the point of doing an album unless you're going to tour? So he agreed to let somebody else tour for him on the road. And we enlisted Rory Mayorga, who was available at the time. Um, Roy is an old friend of mine from New York that I had known before I joined the band. Um, he played in a classic uh, punk hardcore type band called Nausea in New York uh, for for years and other bands as well and uh, it, he was a perfect choice to come aboard um, Sepultura for a tour so this was something that was uh, super important and and quintessential to keep everything going um, before Rory uh, got to Brazil and we started doing rehearsals. Of course, we had to work on a video. And uh, this was something that was one of the best videos, I believe, that Sepultura ever did was Convicted in Life. Um, I had a, a big talk with the, a director. Um, his name was uh, Luis Caron, Caroni, Luis Caroni. And uh, Luis, uh, I had seen some work that he had done, uh, and he, he was a phenomenal director. He had done a lot of really cool stuff. And I wanted to explain the idea of the video because I had an idea in my head of where the video would go, and, the, and it was for this song, Convicted in Life. Um, with Convicted in Life, it was the idea of what you're doing on Earth to have these repercussions in the afterlife, like Dante. Um, so 
there were certain things that I wanted to see in the actual video and I felt this relationship of what you do on earth having something to do in the afterlife um also in the vegan world or in the plant-based world um as far as what you're eating or what you're destroying on this earth you know has repercussions in the end so i i was watching this uh brazilian documentary um that had influenced me a lot to the visuals of the um the video for convicted in life um that movie was uh that documentary god e carne e fraca and so I believe it was that, like, meat is weak, um, and so the meat is weak or something, translation. And so I had Luis find that director to see if we can use some images from that video of showing certain slaughter, the process of the meat industry in Brazil, and to have that, use part of that in the video. Um, so it was great, you know, it was a great uh, adaption that he got and he was able to speak to this director and actually be able to get cleared to use some of that footage. Um, it was our first time using like this green screen. And I just wanted to make sure that it wasn't looking too cheesy with Luis, but he guaranteed that it would be, you know, a stellar video. And uh, it turned out, you know, the, the impact of the video was very strong and it was something um, that hit home a lot. I mean, it was so strong that they it was banned on MTV. Um, they couldn't play it because it was just too strong. Um, but the video really rang true and uh, it really brought out the emotions of that song. So that was amazing to work with him um, and to have that video done. And so once we had the video going, Roy had come to Brazil, he was had done the rehearsals, we were ready to go on the road, and the band that we were going to go on tour with um, was a band called uh, In Flames. And so, In Flames was a band I'd never heard of at that time. I was completely um, oblivious to them, to say the least. And they already had numerous albums, and they were at pretty much at the very top of their game. Um, and so then we were going to do a European tour with them. And um, it was great, you know, it, it was our first time meeting them and, and seeing them play live. And uh, it was a phenomenal tour. We had a lot of fun and we clicked uh, together very well. We're complete, two different bands and different styles, um, but the shows were fantastic. And uh, it was a good combination. A lot of the shows were sold out and um, we just had a lot of laughs, you know, it was really enjoyable experience being with people that truly want to be there, be on the road. And um, once that was said and done, that's when we got back to Brazil and we found out that Eeyore wanted to leave the band, unfortunately. And uh, and the rest was history after that, you know, we, we continued to, to go forward and to not give up. Um, it seemed very dim at that moment but we knew that the writing of that album and working on that album we were at a, a very good level of of as a group as far as being able to create something very interesting um and it was challenging and and we loved the work that we did um and we knew that we wanted to continue on you know, because we didn't want to leave it off with Dante. We wanted to, we knew that there was more that we wanted to do with Sepultura. And, um, and that's where we are today. So I just want to uh, make sure that everyone is staying tuned in to our Sepul Wednesday, Sepul Quanta. And uh, you can subscribe to our page. Definitely do that. And uh, don't forget and let other people know about what's going on. Every Wednesday we are here and we are giving you content with storytellers, live music, special guests. So definitely stay tuned in and we will see you next Wednesday.